Good morning and welcome to the virtual launch of Ron Macari's new book, Things We Could Design for More Than Human-Centered Worlds, just published by NIT Press. We are thrilled to be able to host this conversation between Professor Ron Macari and Professor Peter Paul Verbeck, who will be discussing the thinking behind the book and the potential contributions of the methods, the processes, the epistemological commitments that Ron explores. My name is Kate Hennessy. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University's School of Interactive Arts and Technology. And along with PhD candidate and designer Dunya Uj, I will be moderating today's event. Before we begin, um, I invite you to join me in acknowledging that we're broadcasting from the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Canada has just observed its first National Truth and Reconciliation Day to honor the survivors of residential schools, the children who died in the schools and their families and communities. We acknowledge that the ideology of human-centered worlds has long driven settler colonial violence, racism and extraction in Canada, and that the knowledge of more than human-centered worlds has always been and continues today to be foundational in many Indigenous forms of knowledge and practices. We begin our event today with this in mind, with attention to the humility and generosity Ron calls for in his book, which is certainly needed in this difficult time of reconciliation and truth-telling. Before I invite Dunya to introduce Ron Makari and Peter Paul Fairbeck, let me give you some technical information about the webinar. So uh, you're invited to use the chat for general responses and to comment on the presentation. And it's just wonderful to see your uh, comments coming in, letting us know where you are and even some of the territories that you are uh, dialing in from. Uh, and you're also importantly invited to submit questions for Ron and Peter Paul using the Q&A tool. So throughout the webinar, Dunya and I will be reading these back uh, we'll be uh, look, looking at these. Um, and then at the end of the conversation, we'll be reading these back to uh, Ron and Peter Paul. So you're also invited to use the upvote button to highlight questions that you're especially interested in. So let's get to the main event. I would now like to invite Dunya Uj, who is a PhD candidate, as I mentioned, and a member of the Everyday Design Studio here at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology to introduce Peter Paul Fairbeck and Professor Ron Makari. Thank you, Kate, and hi, everyone. Um, it is my honor today to introduce two amazing scholars, Ron Makari and Peter Paul Fairbeck. Peter Paul Fairbeck is a distinguished professor of philosophy of technology at the Department of Philosophy uh, of the University of Twente. He is chair of the Philosophy of Human Technology Relations Research Group and co-director of the Design Lab. He's also an honorary professor of techno-anthropology at Aalborg University in Denmark. Peter Paul is the author of various books, including What Things Do and Moralizing Technology. And I've heard murmurs that there is another book on the way. <laughs> um, Peter Paul's work has been of significant influence on design and human computer interaction. And he's given designers in particular quite a responsibility. To design is to do ethics by other means. Designers materialize morality. As a designer myself, I remember being equally inspired and intimidated when I first read this quote. Um, but I'm also very, very grateful for the way in which Peter Paul Fabek's work and his collaborations with Ron and um, PhD graduate Sabrina Hauser have expanded the notion of interaction design in critical ways to think more multi-relationally. Ron Wakari is a professor in design here at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University in Canada, where he founded the Everyday Design Studio. He's also a professor and chair of Design for More Than Human-Centered Worlds in the Future of Everyday, uh, in the Future Everyday Cluster in Industrial Design, Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. I feel very, very lucky to call Ron my PhD supervisor. Ron has a really unique way of working with philosophy, philosophy theory, and design practice. And when it comes to things we could design, Ron is always open to risk and silliness brought to you with a disruptive simplicity. Um, at the Everyday Design Studio, we've made a table on table, a tilting bowl, uh, a Wi-Fi router made out of textile. Um, and this is how Ron goes about knowledge, making things that seem silly or impossible, asking questions he doesn't know the answers to, and designing to know. 
The book, Things We Could Design, is a critical and creative speculation on post-humanist design, and it is filled with design examples and new starting points. It is critical of design practice, but always deeply inspiring too. I am so excited for this conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ron Wakari and Peter Paul Verbeek. Thank you, Dunya. Wonderful. Thank you, Dunya. And thank you, Kate. Yeah, wonderful introduction. Super. Yeah, so Ron, there we are. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this is actually quite a special moment for me because uh, I've always been so inspired by your work and I still recall when you invited me to come and give a talk uh, at uh, the this conference and I discovered so many interesting parallels actually between basic questions in philosophy of technology and in design research seeing design research mainly as a form of experimental philosophy you could say so I mean for me it's a uh, very special to be able to have a discussion with you here. And maybe we could start with a very uh, open first question. Could you simply explain to us what motivated you to, to write this book, what things we could design at this specific moment in time? Why this book and why, why now? Well, thank you, Peter. And, and first of all, I'm, I'm so happy that you can join me in this. And, and I, 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 I can't think. Of, Number of people I'd like to talk to, and you're certainly on the top of the list of people I really enjoy always having conversations, discussions with, and and reminding me of the 2014 event. Maybe I'm still recovering from your from talking with you and your talk at at the DISC 2014. I think it was really a good intervention uh, into the field at that time, um, and and I think Donia did a wonderful job. Uh, I think of of pointing out the challenges and and the opportunities. I think you've created for many of us to think through uh, the work, think through design, think through philosophy. And yeah, so, so why did I do the book? I mean, there's any number of reasons. Partly, I think I always thought that what I thought I would, I knew about design often failed me so many times. <laughs> <laughs> and it was getting quite frustrating, um, but also um, uh, probing me to um, experiment and do other things to try other ways to understand what I was doing and what, um, and what design might be. Um, but, you know, on, on, a, on a larger level, um, I mean, certainly I think that we have always sort of questioned the notions of human-centered design, but going to it a little deeper to understanding the kind of human project that it was very much a part of. And certainly a lot of, you know, humanist philosophies and humanist thinking has given us a, a lot and brought us to where we are, but of course it, it, it without some serious consequences. Um, and I think that overwhelming focus on, on, on improving um, and progressing humanity a kind of human exceptionalism has really, we are, you know, inherited. We, we are, we, what we have now, what is, in, what faces us now is, is, is part of that legacy. And then of course that combined with the fact that while we had such focus on how and who we are in this world, meaning we in the humanist sense of saying we, which I think we have to really question in many ways now already, um, but, but totally oblivious to, to what was actually happening with the climate crisis and the Anthropocene. And, 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 and here were a whole set of relations of, of how we, in another sense, really cohabit the world um, that was catching up to us. And what was, you know, so it was big questions, but, but what, 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 does, what was design's role in that? Um, and, and, and what is the trajectory that we set ourselves, or I was setting myself and students and, 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 and part people I work with in terms of design? Yeah, so, so that kind of, was the kind of motivation. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it, it, somehow it reminded me of uh, the work of Papanek, which was yeah. also kind of a bomb that felt like, okay, we have been doing something <laughs> for a long time, and suddenly you see, wow, but why did we do this in the first place, right? So the, the whole idea of human-centered design, which, which was a very important step, right? So not technology-centered, but human-centered. And then claiming that actually human-centered design might not be enough, that we might need to expand the scope. That, that, that is quite a big step. I mean, what, what, what um, made you see that we, we had to make that step? Because it, I think it, it, it goes against many things that many designers think as very important. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a really great. It, it's hard to think about design without bumping into the, the assumptions and principles and values and even mantras that we hold on to that come from human center design and 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 you know I, I think that there but 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 there is again I think the consequence I mean on a day-to-day -day level talk to students um, and, and you see what concerns them and what values they hold and what they want what aspirations they want for why they want to engage design 
and then those who have graduated and, and find themselves in the work that they're doing, and, and not just the lack of personal satisfaction, but the sense of urgency about what they feel, the potential of what can be done versus what they are doing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and a need for vocabulary, you know, really, I think this is, you know, the, the, the notion that theory has little to do with practice is, is an, an, an odd formulation to me. I think we need language, we need concepts, we need framings, we need lenses, and we have to think our way through this and design our way through this. But uh, so, so that's what it was. I think, I think it was just, you know, and I, I think also there, there is, I mean, I, there's some discussion in the book about being humble, but there's a lot, there's a lot of assumptions that lead to a whole level of arrogance in design. But, but you know, it was interesting <laughs> about, you mentioned, you mentioned Papadik, and that's such a great start to his book. But well, he comes out at the beginning of that book and he does not, he does not pull any punches. He basically says design has messed everything up. <laughs> um, and it, it, it is fascinating when you read that. And, and then it's also a little bit depressing because, you know, I, don't, I can't recall when did that book come out and where are we, you know, not much has yeah. changed since then. Uh, I mean, I'm, okay, I'm, that's not fair to say. Yes, okay, things have changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Your book yeah, is okay. there, right? <laughs> so, well, you know, I think that uh, I, was, I, was, I was channeling, I was channeling uh, Papinate there. Nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah. exactly. No, I mean, um, I, I think I recognize a bit of uh, the, well, maybe I actually recognize a lot of what uh, is behind that idea. I mean, uh, also in ethics, I think I've always felt that uh, a focus on only human ethics and the, 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 the human significance in ethics is way too narrow to address the issues that we are facing in our society, seeing the technology is changing society, that we have uh, well, to deal with an ecological crisis, etc. And it has caused a lot of resistance also. I mean, I've always liked to, 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 to refer to Foucault, who was then speaking about the blackmail of the Enlightenment. I thought, okay, this is the blackmail of humanism. So as soon as you try to question human exceptionalism, suddenly you, you, you get, oh, you're against the human. So you, yes. you don't yes. trust the human. They, they should not be autonomous. And so are you um, somehow concerned that people might explain your book along those lines? Yeah. I mean, yes, but but I think, and I, I was careful. I was trying to be careful about the way I, I wrote it, and you know, and, and the book is in three parts. Where it, 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 part one sort of tries to unpack design and and, and takes key concepts of, of, of non-humanist or post-humanist thinking, relationality, situated knowledge, intentionality, and try to rethink what we mean by discipline design. Do we need a discipline design? And, and and then part two is about things, and part three is about the designer. But going back to your question, part one. So I purposely tried to be really expansive and generous and not argue against human-centered design, no. but the very, but you, about being expansive. Um, and, and, and I did say, but I did set it up so that we could talk about design discipline without foundations. So I wouldn't have to argue against the assumptions, but step aside and say, let's be much more expansive and, 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 and pluralistic about the way we understand design. And, and you know, I called it a critical creative speculation. Just just humor me. Let, let me set up an alternative next to what we have. And then let's see. So um, yeah, I, I hope that some of that generosity extends to the reader. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So so I, I I didn't mean to insinuate that you are uh, no you know, I, I think that this is exactly what I recognize that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you are against human centered design. It doesn't mean that you're against the human being if you want to expand it. But still, it is quite a big challenge, right? So maybe one of the key words, indeed, that you also just use is that things are somehow relational. Uh, they're vital, right? So we cannot live without our relations to things, and things cannot live with, with well, live <laughs> without <laughs> their relations to us. Can, can you explain then maybe a bit more what you mean by that to, 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 to take us in your post-human-centered thinking? Yeah, you know, and I go through, I mean, obviously many people have formulated, including, you know, this notion, including yourself, um, and, and, and certainly start with ideas in post-phenomenology about technological mediation. And, and I do, I did start in that whole discussion between Donna ID and Donna Haraway, and both discussing about discussing the Garden of Eden, you know, saying that the cyborg was not has no conception of the Garden of Eden, is what Donna Haraway would say. And and Donna I, and ID would argue that this Garden of Eden had to be so such a narrow, perfect place that per perfectly match mapped to who we are as humans in order for us to survive. Both really making the point that what we call technology or things is been so fundamental to shaping who we are 
and how we have been in this planet and how we interact with each other, et cetera, et cetera, has shaped everything. Um, and so in that, whether we call it technological mediation or whether that was just an, a, 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 a better, more generous understanding of what is life and vitality and agency across you know, humans and, and non-humans. So, but you know, we know this in design. It's interesting, I think we know this, that we think about you know, in, in, the, in some classic human-centered design about changing behavior that we think that we know, that we, we, we believe this relationship between the things we make will change behavior of other people. So we'll shape people. But, but, but I think, I think the, 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 the narrowness of thinking though is that we control that shaping through the things we make. That, that, it, that it extends a simple extension of our own abilities to do this, uh, which, which, which doesn't acknowledge that relationality, that, that the, the effect that those things themselves have on us that we don't control as designers. I can always return, and this is what, you know, as much as I try to engage the philosophy, I, I always kind of return to what is my thinking as a designer? Well, what is this? How would I approach this? What does this mean? And that helps me. That um, is but, yeah. It, 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 this almost sounds like religious language, right? So there's a, a sense of humility in, uh, in design. And so design on the one hand seems to be this, this well, power that you have over, over matter and you have your ID and you design it into the world. And then on the other hand, you feel, okay, in order to do so, I also need to be modest. And yeah, there's a sense of humility involved there. But does it take your ideas about design also in some kind of a religious direction or would that be too, too far-fetched to, to hmm. say? I mean, I, I think again, yeah, I don't, I don't think about it specifically in those terms. I do think about a more expansive way of thinking, you know, and I think we, I mean, to me, you know, whether, you, whether you, you say religious or you say, I mean, you can connect to spiritualism, you can connect to animism, you can connect to indigenous epistemologies about seeing the whole world alive and having respect for that. And of course, variations of that. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I think that kind of the, but I, I do see this as something that we inherit in, in humanist philosophy of separating everything out and reducing them thing into, into objective separated reduced notions that, are dis, that can stand on their own that we could think about. Yeah. We should think about only what something does, not how an emotional relation to that about our spiritual relation to that. That seems like a separate or an add on. You know, <laughs> that makes sense. No, um, ab ab I mean, absolutely. I think it's really interesting also that you connect to uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous thinking. I mean, I think uh, if there's one thing that we're discovering at the moment in uh, our globalizing world is that uh, this well, intercultural theme has become super important. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm more in the field of, of, of ethics and quite active within UNESCO. And we're also discovering that this intercultural ethical dialogue is very very important well, to 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 be able to also advise governments on a on a world scale so yeah. now I, I, from, from from what you say i think intercultural thinking also in design thinking seems to play a role so do you uh, yeah somehow share that that idea and if so uh, could you indeed have uh, something like cultural well, culture based design thinking or in intercultural I mean, I, design I think we yeah. Yes, I mean, I think we do. I mean, I think it's a question of what we recognize as design versus what, what you know, what occurs if we, if we think about designing as yeah. shaping, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, of course, I think you know, a, a good reference for that, for that is Arturo Escobar's, um, uh, you know, design for the pluriverse, but I think, which I think looks at, at distinctions of, you know, pays attention to distinctions between global south and global north and different activities, different engagements, different practices of design. In the book, when I, when I talk about unbuilding or rethinking design, not as a humanist discipline, I, I offer the idea of nomadic practices, that if we accept that someone makes a claim to design something uh, within their situation and what they gather around that is design. Um, and, and so, and I think that's also the other thinking is I think we've, we, you know, which is part of the human exceptionalism or part of professionalizing and universalizing design is not only do we flatten, but we, we, whether we do this willfully or not, we obscure yeah. other practices or we hide other practices. Yeah. So I absolutely believe, yes. I mean, I think there, I think there's a, there, there's a multitude of ways in which we can engage what we call designing. 
Um, yeah. And some of that is definitely is, is definitely regional, local, ethnic, but also some of that is just different diversity of situations and diversity of intentionalities in the world. Yeah, so th- I mean that might have a lot of implications for design education as well, right? If, yes. if you think yes. of design as nomadic, yes, I think you you give up the idea of just one stable foundation that holds for yeah. everyone that you can just learn. And, and, and so, in, in that sense, I think your book has a lot of implications for design education. Can, can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, that's someone. I, I mean, I didn't really pursue it in the book, but certainly something that 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 I was thinking, and and I wonder sometimes. I mean, we could just say, you know, we should, I mean, and I think it's a good question about, I mean, I, I'm skeptical of the larger projects that say, this is the way we have to do design education. And there's some, there's some happening now. And I think this is probably true of any, a, a, any field. Um, and because, you know, I, I think that when we look at, when we look at the things that we've actually really have valued or have had effect, they've been come from different pockets around the world of different design schools. Um, and, and, and I think sometimes, you know, the, the most interesting things are happening where you're not looking, but I guess it does mean empowering on some level. I would hope, I guess the positive story would be, I would hope that those who felt this difference between what they were practicing and what was being universalized as the practice of design, that they had more confidence to engage in what they were practicing and put that into education. Um, and, and, and I think that there's, even though we might have a, many different ways to design it doesn't preclude sharing notions you know take i mean intersections between the different ways and learning from others um i, I mean yeah i i do think that's a big i, I think you're right and it's something i thought well you know is that the next thing to talk about it you know and really engage in education but how do you do it because it is i mean and i guess it's also a bigger question we have about if you really take on the multiplicity of things how do you engage multiplicity how, how do you engage all these things at once yeah, it's overwhelming sure. Yeah, no, and I think this is the challenge of uh, intercultural thinking at at large, right? So that you uh, don't want to end up in some form of relativism, but at the same time, it's important to 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 show that your ideas are relative. You could say to to uh, the cultural context from which you are doing the work. I mean, it also made me wonder, and maybe after that we should go back to the content of your book, but it also <laughs> made me wonder how your um, book also emerged from the work that you do, the design work that you do in your studio with your students, with your PhD students, where also this intercultural dimension must play quite a big role. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I think that, you know, so over the years, I mean, we've been doing this work and um, sort of speculative design or thing-centered design and doing the kind of, you know, taking a kind of counterfactual relationship to what is normally done in design, do what you call experimental philosophy. And I I never thought of it that way at the time, although I did think about trying to understand, <laughs> trying to take a different position to understand what design is. And over the years, but I also realized that I didn't have a full, you know, because you, you do your projects, you know, like all of us, we're just engaged in projects and writing and teaching and so on. You don't get the chance to take a break and think through longer term or, or have, a, have, a, have a bigger picture. So that's what the book afforded. I think I was feeling like I was running out of space to think about or to talk about what I really wanted to do. And so that was set it up for the book was to take the work and what were the implications and, and what were some of the, the questions it was asking. And also to get ahead of myself. I, I really wanted the book when I, when I started writing it, I wanted to, to at the end of it, you know, was not where I was, but to arrive at, an, at another place. Um, so that was the kind of thinking. And then I think having a, a you know, I, I think what you talked about is, which has been really, I've been really lucky to have, you know, a, as you well know, you know, a foot in the Netherlands, a foot in Canada, and engage um, uh, things internationally. And and that puts it in a, in a certain context where it's pretty hard to argue that there is one way to do something. Yeah. <laughs> we teach design very differently here <laughs> and it's a view versus what goes on tonight though and and they're both equally you know valuable or, or i i take from both equally how about that yeah yeah, yeah. so that whole sense of humility actually also comes from it's quite real yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i can imagine so maybe just to to give the uh, the audience a bit of an idea of the structure of your book because we are doing a lot of things around it but so the, the, the book has three parts uh, and i think uh, we, we just had a, a chat about the architecture of your book well those three parts were already set from the start so part one is design part two is things and part three is the designer so maybe just to, to give people an idea of the book, could you explain a, a bit of this architecture of your uh, 
Yeah. So, so I said at the book, you know, I, I, I argue we need something more than more, more than human centered. Um, and, and, and then I, I sort of say, I have kind of three questions that I want to, to tackle. Um, and I want to unbuild what I know in a sense. Right. And, and so I've had to start with, and I think that the question of, well, not so much what is design, but also to be creative about it. So how can we, so part one is, as we talked about this was thinking through design uh, and also, I wanted to be clear that when I rethought this, I wasn't, I was, you know, uh, committed to other sets of principles, non-humanist and post-humanist principles, not not to redo things. So anyway, the, the unbuilding, which we talked about the first part, was design. And and what that really was, though, was rethinking, how can we think about this without, a, aside from being a humanist discipline, but it was also purposeful. I wanted to create a space for me <laughs> to then, you know, I can now engage what I really wanted to engage, which was part two of the book, which is what is a thing. And so if we're not talking about use, if we're not talking about functionality, if it's not just about semantics, if it's not just about, you know, uh, 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 you know, commercialism and capitalism, you know, what, what else can it be? And if, how expansive can I be about this? And, and, but also I wanted to take to heart, again, the ideas of relationality um, and, and, and our, our interconnectedness with things and then the distributed agency of things. And those are the two post, you know, post-humanist, non-humanist uh, uh, principles I really brought into rethinking what is it the something that we design? And, and so they're talking about how, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about how, how whether through technological mediation or intentionality um, uh, or, or ideas of shared agency, very different thing we're talking about. But I think it also helped to account for what we talk about in design, unintended consequences, or we talk about in design of kind of, you know, wicked problems. There's a whole other way where it's always wicked. <laughs> it's, it's always, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and it's, it, it, it is sort of complex in that sense, but I think it's quite real. Um, and we can account for a lot of what happens in the things that we make. Yeah. So that was sort of part two of the book. So, it, but if we have a world in which the things we make are so fundamental to who we are, and we can't think of being human or being in, in, in a differentiated sense of humans, we're all different, but we can't think of that without things. And then we think of the things that tra transform and shape the world as much as anything else. Then when it comes to talking about the designer, so there are two things, which is part three, which is the designer, is we can't think of the designers being exclusively human, or I couldn't think of it so that way. And, and, and I started talking about how um, we then need to think about, I, I, the metaphor I used, and I, I, I sort of took this from Tim Ingold, was the idea of flying a kite. So if you think about, you know, it, when, when we fly a kite, you don't, I don't, if I'm holding the string, I'm not flying that kite. You know, I'm not guiding the flight path. I'm in there together with the wind, the temperature, the air pressure and everything else. And it's this assembly of humans and non-humans that are flying the kite. And I think design is very much like that. Um, and, and if we understand, I think it brings the principles of relationality and, and, and distributed agency there. But also, I think then we, we you know, the other aspect of, of this, um, if things are so connected and shaping the world, you can't avoid the politics and the accountability of stuff that happens. Um, you know, we make things and what happens to them um, and, and what's the consequences of bringing something into the world in a world that we cohabit. So if we're so... I. I should have said this earlier, the kind of phrase I had, I used was we design with, not that we design, but we design with. And so we're always designing with, within a world too. Um, that, so two terms that came up when I was describing uh, in part three, talking about the designer that, um, and this notion of extended, you know, humans and non-humans. One is biography. So when we, when as, 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 a designer with uh, with others with more than you know more than human sense together design things that share a life. We cohabit a world quite literally, but also we're forever connected to the thing that we made. And so I think that's really interesting to think about that this deep connectedness that you as a designer had to what you make. And the term biography was that shared life, but also that the the the, the writing part that we inscribe something into the world when we design something. We also opened up the possibility to think about well, what do we leave behind? What happens in the end? What happens until we die? Um, and then the last, the other notion I had in that part three was the dealing with the politics of design, that, that relationality, that profound relation that it has and how it connects to you know, the implications in the world, the consequences. But I think many ways in design, we, we exclude the politics by 
focusing on the design problem. We remove everything so we can solve the design problem. Yeah. But all the things we remove come back to get us, they come back to haunt us. And I, I was trying to think of a way that we bring that in. And so I talked about constituency and this bringing together humans and non-humans and, and you know, part based on Latour's parliament of things and, and to think through how we can mobilize this in the context of design. Yeah, I mean, super interesting to, to hear that architecture. And I think also your focus on politics at the end is uh, really important. And I mean, again, here, I feel a lot of resonance with things that have been happening within my own subfield within philosophy of technology. And the whole post phenological approach has, has always been accused of being too uh, individualistic, too micro-oriented, just like designers have often been accused of only working yes. on individual artifacts and not on the bigger picture. Right? And I think the solution that you found with that notion of biographies, anti-biographies was super interesting eh? because it, 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 it connects the work of the designer, the individual design work to, well, the life that an object will have in, in society to which you are connected as a designer somehow. And so, I mean, you have that example of the Camden bench, which is also playing quite a big role in post phenomenology actually. Robert Rosenberg wrote a lot about uh, public benches and uh, unhoused people and how how, how it discriminates against unhoused people. I mean, does your thinking about politics also somehow originate from post phenomenological thinking? Is it different? Uh, can we learn in, in post phenomenology from your design work and the other way around? Could you give some reflections on that, uh, Ron? Yeah. So you mentioned Robert Rosenberg, and I, you know, and, and I've, and, and really, you know, his book, Callous Objects, where he really engages this idea um, uh, and, uh, of the, the, the dominant stabilities and it creates these political occlusions and hides things. He talks public benches. And so that was really, and it was great. It really, it, it did. I mean, I, I spent some time talking about that in the book. It's important. So yes, what it connected for me was he talked about the specific idea of the, the need to interpret things around us. They, they, even though they're so fundamental, they, through the concept of multi-stability, they, 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 depending on our embodied relation to them, they can be interpreted in many different ways. And he connected that to politics in a really wonderful way. And also then brought in uh, 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 Latour um, as well and, and into that, which I was also working with. Um, so I think that that connection to the notion that he had that we, the, the desire to, I mean, so one way I saw that the things are so vital and we always need to interpret them. And the meaning of this can be like multiple meanings of this. But the role, that, what he really brought out was the role of design to, in some sense, shut that down. And it was an interesting connection to me between design wanting to prescribe a, a very particular use for the things it makes. And all of the things that are not part of that use, it gets rid of. But not making that connection to the politics, which is that designing this, which is exclusionary of public spaces. And so in some sense, what that shows is through multi-stability, through distributed agency, you're always going to have the politics. And then what, of course, Latour calls is thing politics. But definitely a connection. And I think one that, you know, and I'm looking forward, because I know I've talked to you a little bit about your book, and I'm looking forward to what you're going to say <laughs> about this, because I know that this is something that is something that you've been thinking about. Um, and, and I think that's the bigger question, which is really why it helped me to say that, that in design, we need to shift our attention to our, our the collective structures by which we try to design, not the individual ones. This is what the notion of the constituency is. And then one that allows us not only to include stakeholders, human stakeholders, but all the consequences of all the other relations that we have when we design something. Um, you know, in some ways, public space, and I think this was another brilliant thing that Robert did was he, he focused in on public spaces. And public spaces are these incredibly entangled spaces. Uh, and, and, and he also showed the deception of a bench as, an, as a social amenity which in reality was social exclusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it just, again, just, to me, I've always thought the things are really powerful and he kind of showed how they were powerful. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I mean, I, indeed, I think that whole hermeneutic dimension, if I may use a big philosophical uh, word, uh, so the, the interpretational dimension is extremely important uh, in the post theological approach. And I think also the way in which you deal with the notion of biographies uh, connects to that, right? So that there is this narrative in which things play a role uh, that help us, uh, that helps us interpret the world around us. And I think, yeah, I mean, if I go to my own work, I, I would say that the connection to Latour would be that for Latour, um, politics is always about issues that exist for uh, a public. And I think uh, technology is 
products, design things always uh, bring together a public, but also help us to to make an issue an issue, right? So they help us to mm-hmm. the world and they help a group of people to come together to the to to do that interpretation. And I, well, I really believe that your notion of biographies can 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 play a very important role in deepening that understanding of the politics of uh, of things. But uh, well, maybe what I found most intriguing was also the way in which your uh, whole story reflects back on the designer uh, herself or himself. I mean, the consequence of thinking in this post-humanistic way is also that as a designer, you are not the source of the, de- not the only source of the design. Yeah. Right? Just, I mean, yes. like your metaphor of the, of the kite. Uh, uh, so as a designer, you are designed as well by the things that you are designing, by the context that you are designing for. I mean, in your book, you very nicely show uh, that so uh, can you re- maybe somehow s- say a bit more about that so how do you experience that yourself as a, as a designer uh, and how should we then think of the role of the designer if it's not having the power over things yeah it's 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 um and i think at some point in the book i write about how so after after talking about things and that and, and this is actually one of the things the takeaways from understanding post phenomenology well that things are so powerful they're so interconnected they mediate everything in our lives um and then you would think as a designer you might think oh man that's that's great that makes me powerful because i'm the one who designs those things but then you realize actually that your power is incredibly limited within that because of because of all the other things that we have we have talked about and you know so so i think that 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 coming back to this notion that you are part of a you know, an assembly of other things that are, that are, I, I talked about it in ways that, yes, you are definitely shaped. Um, but also I think we had needed to put it in, in a temporal sense because designs also want to pay attention to the fact that things we design live over time and the things are designed and redesigned. I think I gave the example of the, the traffic intersection. We're adding to the traffic intersection um, and showing that, you know, I don't know who designs the, the, the traffic intersection, but there are different moments of intensity that a designer gets involved. But you never, I, in that part of it, if I had to really kind of simplify, is one of the things I hope that the book is trying to say is that we as the human designers have actually a limited power in the things that they design, but with but has an essential role in that. And, with, and we need to learn how to design within those limits um, and, and, and understand that we, all the positions that we've secured as designers, like the design problem, I think is the safest, most secure position for a designer. Cause you determine what the design problem is. You exclude all the things that you can't solve in that. I mean, I'm making a bit of a, 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 a caricature here because it's much more complicated than that, but still, nevertheless, I think it is a position where you are not shaped and you are doing all the shaping. You create an asymmetry. And I think we need to shift the balance where that, that, that the asymmetry isn't there and you are equally prone. And, and this actually goes to what something I, I think I also took, talked about, you, relate, you mentioned Foucault earlier, and then also in, in your book on moralizing technologies and the idea of self-practice and autopoiesis, the self-shaping in the relation in, with respect to always being mediated by technology. So the question becomes, of course, you know, an investigation of how that media, how do I become someone who's mediated by technology? Yeah, how do you practice that? And I took that to heart with designing. That's a very similar thing. How do I, how do, within, within what I just described, how do I then do a self-practice of designer within that? Yeah, wonderful. I mean, this is indeed a very nice way also to explain that mm-hmm. idea of autopoiesis, mm-hmm. that, that it also reflects back on you. I mean, it also somehow reminded me of Heidegger. I mean, even though I have a, a very ambivalent relationship to yes. Heidegger, I think the whole idea of design, I mean, if, if you use the, the German word entwerfen, it means something like un, un, uh, unthrowing. Yeah? So you are thrown into your existence and you try to find a relation to what you are thrown into, right? So it, it yes. is not you as the, the, the source of power, you are the designer, you make whatever you want, but you have to feed yourself into a pre-existing structure. And I think what you add to that is that also you as a designer are, uh, well, part of the process. So yeah. Maybe that can take me to the last question because I see time is ticking. But I mean, you have the beautiful concept of transmogrification <laughs> in your book. <laughs> Meaning that, uh, well, there is this change of uh, of who we are in relation to to things and to uh, well, uh, humans, non-humans. Um, 
of course, this applies to you <laughs> as well, right? So not only the designer changes in interaction with the designs that she or he is making, but I think also the the author, <laughs> Ron Wakari, <laughs> might have changed <laughs> in, in interaction with the, the, the book that he has been uh, writing. So can you say a bit about that? I mean, how, how has this affected you as a design theorist, as a designer, yeah. maybe as a, as a person? That's a great question. So, so, I mean, I did say at the beginning that I set out to do something that I was ahead of me that I didn't know. And, and I feel, you know, good. the book is out and I feel like it still makes sense. Um, but I think now I kind of have to not live up to the words, but, but act, act with those words. So I, it, yeah, so the, the, yes, it's created a problem for me because it really has changed how I think about what I do <laughs> um, and what I should do. And, and the positive of that is that there is a lot to do, which is really exciting, but finding different ways to do it is the challenge. But absolutely, I think, you know, I think, and I did reflect a little bit, like what is it, you know, my own practice and, and the studio that I have and how is that more of a constituency than it really is now? And that, that's, how do I acknowledge, how do I pursue this notion of biography in the works that I do? And we're trying to do that. And it's always a lot harder to act. Okay, writing is hard. I think we can agree to that, but it's also harder to act. <laughs> so, so yes, I think it is. I, and I, 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 I take that as a positive because I hope for those readers who are patient enough and pursue to, you know, the, 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 the book to the end um, will feel the same. I mean, I, I would hope that's what you would want to do in a book is have some change, but I think also as the author, you want to change yourself. So, yes. Yeah, beautiful. Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, wonderful. I, so I think uh, this must give the audience quite a good idea of what the book is. Uh, maybe is... if you read the book, you go through it. <laughs> Replication <laughs> as well. I think at least that, that was the experience that I had. Uh, it was so interesting and so deep and so original to see all the connections between uh, design research, philosophy, also the bigger questions that our world is facing. It's uh, amazing. Uh, so uh, I hope that everyone who has heard this conversation will be even more intrigued <laughs> than they were already because of the beautiful title of your book and because of everything that they've heard and that they will, will buy it. And uh, maybe we should now uh, also engage with the audience, Ron, because uh, I see many questions popping up. Yeah. Those are really kind words. Thank you, Peter Paul. And, and they're good because I had some questions I wanted to ask you that I didn't get a chance. So <laughs> maybe that'll come up. <laughs> I hope we have some, some time for that. And yeah. if not now, then we can always do that in Eindhoven or in Twitter. Absolutely. Well, um, I'll, I'll jump in now, now just to say thank you so much, Ron and Peter Paul, for your very engaging conversation and introduction to the book. Um, as you say, we're having a lot of uh, very interesting questions being submitted. So we'll move to the Q&A portion and um, we'll start just by reading some of the questions that are coming in. And uh, for those in the audience, you can always uh, upvote the questions you'd like to see next. So I will uh, invite Dunya to uh, read the first one out and I look forward to your ongoing conversation. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so the first question is from Anthony. Um, and uh, they're asking who is and who is not a designer in all this? Are we talking narrowly about a professional class? What about the multitudes of everyday persons making everyday decisions? Yeah, so I mean, my, you know, my, my take on that is, is of course, I think I, one time I wrote that everyone is a designer. So I, I think it is this multitude, but I did I mean, be more specific here that I think the point I was trying to make. So, so first of all, it's well beyond the professional class of design. And I tried to set up in some sense, when I talked about the pluralities of design, what I called nomadic practices, that the professional class is only one of many possible uh, ways of designing. So if you like, there really is this pluriverses of design, or I took that to heart, this pluriverse of design. But the important point I think I was trying to make is that open up the ability for anybody to claim to be designing something. And, and I think that's what's important. I think that we, we have to be careful that behind a lot of this kind of what is design, whether that be professional design or whether that be academic definitions of the discipline of design, there's, there, there's an inherent policing there. Uh, and that is what I think we can't afford. We can't afford this policing. We can't afford people not being uh, having the ability to say, I'm designing something and other people have gathered around with me to design this something. And it's just as important, even though it may not involve X, Y, or Z. Yeah, I think 
if if I can step into the this yes, question, please. I mean, you, you could also reverse the observation, uh, Anthony. I mean, I think the current work that you see in citizen science and all kinds of democratization of uh, activities in society find their origins in uh, the development that design has gone through. Had uh, the whole idea of co-design. Uh, the, the, I mean, I think the designers were the first to think uh, that, well, why would the designer know better what the customer wants than, than the customer uh, her or himself, right? And I think that that whole idea of democratization has uh, somehow trickled down into society. I mean, my own work is currently a lot about citizen ethics. Yeah, so why would have why would ethicists have a monopoly on, on ethics? Yeah, if, if there are real issues uh, at stake in society, then probably people experiencing the impacts of new technologies have uh, also a very important voice, need to have a very important voice in ethical discussions. So um, in that sense, I think uh, the idea that the designer is the sole source of power has been left behind already quite a long time ago. <laughs> and I think Ron adds to this a very important notion that actually... Uh, even in, if you take it one step further, the designer herself, himself, is also co-designed by the design work that she or he is doing. And that makes it, uh, that gives it a form of reflexivity and sensitivity. And uh, yeah, maybe the, the word is, uh, might be a form of humility, but also sensitivity that is really needed to be a good designer. So in, in order to be a designer, acknowledging the designership of other people is one thing, but also ag acknowledging that you as a designer are shaped <laughs> by the context <laughs> for which you are designing is maybe uh, a second. Thank you. Um, just, just a quick follow up on that question. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to who is not a designer in this whole more relational view on designing things. So what happens if, for example, non-humans refuse to participate in designing? Um, and, and do we need all non-humans to participate? Um, could you speak to that a bit? No, we don't need all non-humans to participate. I, I do think that you have... Um, I mean, I mean, I think also we should we should put the question temporally too. I mean, I think you're not always designing. You're not always a designer. I mean, I think that be careful about what that means. And we, where, and 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 so I think at different instances, yeah, majority of people. I mean, I'm not designing now. You know, so it's it's so so I think that that, that, that that's one part. And not everyone is is a designer, but I would like to open up the ability for everyone to claim to design. But another important part of that, I think, is affinity. Um, and I think our, our kind of um, uh, shared goals, you know, and, but, but I think those two things together um, are important in, in that sense. And I think non you know, I think in a sense of more than human, it's, it's complicated because you may have, a, you know, I, I think you have relations, but I, I think also the affinities that are, that are, that are brought together. And, and I think it goes beyond what we think about in co-design or participatory design is who are the stakeholders? Because that, that, that determines you actually know all the relations that are going on and you don't. Um, and maybe it's process and you open it up, but, but I think that there is a set of um, working through who and what needs to gather that just can't be taken for granted. And I think actually that's the bigger work that designers need to pay attention to now. Yeah, yeah. maybe to make it very philosophical, maybe I don't want to make it too philosophical, but I think from what Ron is just um, argue so interestingly in his book that you as a designer are also designed by what you are designing i think the the non-humans and the the, the non-designing uh, at least the non-agency having entities are still there because of our recognition of the importance of their existence i mean it, it somehow so reminds me of uh, a philosopher like levy nuts eh, who says that our agency is also always encountering the agency of other people and the kind of responsibilities that that brings uh, so in that sense through the designer that you are uh, the, the 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 context for which you are designing is there as well in your design activity <laughs> uh, so in that sense the non-humans are there as well as as a designer as as part of what makes a designer a designer let me uh read the next question that's uh, come up to the top of the list here um so this is a question from Zara Jalali at Emily Carr University. She asks, does co-creation and or participation with more than humans play a role in design and the design process as a way of giving them agency and decentering human and human designers? How can we design with them versus for? Yeah, so that's a, I mean, a good question. I mean, I think that 
you know, watch our role in terms of stewardship of these things. That can we really be human stewards of things that are not human? But let me put it another way, though. I think I, I talked about. I think more simply, we could talk about the the necessity and the willingness of designers to think to do to act as if they're designing with. So bringing things um, to the actually taking on the responsibility uh, to find ways to bring things human more than human ways to the table. So I think that's yes. But on the other hand, design with also speaks to the reality. The reality is things will come to the table or they will be they're connected whether you like it or not. You always design with. That you know there there are there are the, the implications of the things that are connected, the consequences of the things that are connected that you didn't think about. So in some sense that even makes you more accountable or or, or more responsible in a sense to seek those out um, and understand through the biography of something what that would be, the, the, the reality of designing with. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, it also reminds me a lot of the discussion that we have at the moment within the ethics of technology about value dynamism and about how actually the technologies that we are designing also affect the value frameworks from which we are evaluating these very technologies, right? So that there is no independent outside position uh, to do uh, something like responsible design as if it would, would be pre-given what that responsibility means. And so what that responsibility means interacts with <laughs> the thing that you are designing. And so in that sense, I think uh, you could say that there is a co-creation <laughs> really of the designer and what she is designing. And, so th and that is also a decentering of the designer, but also of the ethicist. And I, I can tell you that that's not always an, uh, an easy thing to accept for ethicists uh, because typically they lean on the idea that there is this pre-given framework that you apply to a technology and suddenly the framework starts to be uh, nomadic, uh, to use Ron's words. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, that, that, that is a big challenge. Thanks for that. Um, the next question is from Petko Karateshev from Albrecht University. Um, what are your thoughts on object-oriented ontology, such as the work of people like Timothy Morton, as a tradition in thinking about more than human design and a different way of engaging diverse communities? That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, so you know what? It is a big one. And then f funnily, and maybe I was, I was having fun. I actually commented that as, as a footnote in, in the book, um, in the sense that I was trying to make distinctions about post-humanism and how I was kind of following critical post-humanities, not necessarily object-oriented ontologies. Um, and, and I think in the work of Timothy Morton, Graham Hartman, and so on, I mean, wonderful descriptions, but I do think for me, it was a very different project. For, for me, it is, it's an ontological question. I think one of the, the you know, I think for those in, you know, they have different ways of dividing the world that is object-oriented ontologist about those are what they call undermining and overmining. We won't get into all of that. <laughs> but a lot of the things that I was interested in, the effects, um, the, 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 the correlations um, between us and things are not things that object-oriented ontologists are not. Um, and, and um, you know, I am really, so there's an interesting one, Graham Hartman was asked about his critique of, of, of Bruno Latour and actor network theory is, well, when do you stop tracing things on the network? And, and I, my, as I understand it, Latour's answer is when it gets boring. <laughs> and for Hartman, that wasn't good enough. You have to pursue it right to the end. And I'm not interested in pursuing it right to the end. I'm interested in when it stops being boring because that's, I, I think, and that's the kind of materialist realist uh, uh, sense that I have. Having said that, I think wonderful descriptions. I mean, Timothy Morton's descriptions of ecologies and I think are just they, they, they are really apt for where we are, but I did not find them uh, uh, as as I mean that was really what was my take on on my relationship to that. Yeah, I totally share that idea. It's super interesting work and uh, uh, very important work also to uh, shake up a bit our ontologies and our human centered way of thinking. So I think that's the the the, the most important uh, contribution. But indeed, um, so my experience of uh, delving more deeply into it is that in the end, the relations between humans in the world end up being the objects in object-oriented ontology, right? So it's much closer to phenomenology, but maybe that's because I'm a phenomenologist, uh, than uh, it suggests. So uh, I see that there is a difference, but I also see a lot of affinity. And um, yeah, I mean, the work is really inspiring also, uh, as, and I've especially engaged a lot with the very interesting comments of Graham Harmon on Heidegger's work. 
but um, uh, we, we also had the op opportunity to discuss this together at a very interesting PhD defense actually in Denmark of Søren Ries who uh, did his PhD on uh, his second PhD on uh, Latour and Heidegger and uh, we ended up being very close because if you <laughs> see the relations between humans and world as the object that is there then suddenly all, uh, all things come together so uh, but maybe we should talk about this more Petco because I know you, <laughs> we know each other. So uh, looking forward to the next time that uh, that we meet Petco. Well, thank you. Our, our next question comes from Matt Rado at the University of Toronto. And uh, Matt asks, what are the opportunities for forms of post-human design to impact the larger world? Are we restricted to didactic forms, exhibitions, the academic context as the site of our interventions? Do you have any guidance regarding ways for these modes to reach our built environments more generally? Great question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. That's a great question. Um, and um, figured you'd come up with a question like that. Uh, so <laughs> I know, Matt. So, um, but, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, but I think absolutely. I mean, and I think so one of the things, let me just, so, and I think is what I'm most excited about, you know, Peter Paul asked me how it changed me and, and what I want to pursue next. And, and I'm really interested in this idea of constituencies and biographies. And, and I do think there's a there's a, a, a real relationship to social design. Um, and I do talk in the book about participatory design uh, and, and the work, how it relates to that. And and I and one of, and to, to focus it even more clearly, I think that, we need to designers need to turn our attention toward the collective structures by which we design and the collective structures that account for a kind of for a more than human world. So I've been doing some work um, in uh, Elisava and um, uh, IAC in Barcelona and where they have had a history of doing work in social design and working through collective structures that are more than human within urban structures, within trying to create urban, urban environments and urban spaces. I think it opens up I th actually, I think it's a more obvious connection, to be totally honest. The way some of the, 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 the language and the concepts of post-humanism, I think that they relate. If, you know, we had that earlier discussion about spirituality and, and questions of humility. And I think some of these things that you can, you can sense the need for this. Um, and and I hopefully also that I think it, I, I, I try to open up a framing in the book, which accounts for all kinds of other practices of design that are not readily acknowledged in human-centered design. Exactly. Yeah, I, I couldn't uh, agree more with you, Ron. So I think indeed social design is one thing, and the whole idea of um, letting design thinking trickle down to address societal questions. And then the most in interesting thing that happens is that people think, okay, we have this engineering approach to societal issues, and then as soon as you you you, you open that, it's it's really a can of worms. Of course, <laughs> it it is not so easy. It, it's not that we have this uh, algorithm that we can follow, and uh, and we have an app for that. So introducing design thinking to address societal issues also means that people get a different idea of what it means to, to design. <laughs> and indeed that you are interacting with the context and that you as a designer also change because of the thing you are designing. So um, that, well, and indeed that, that the whole ideal of the humanist autonomous subject that imposes typically his will <laughs> onto reality is totally gone as soon as you start to uh, apply design thinking to the social world. And what I hope actually also in my teaching for engineering students in, in engineering design is that that design thinking approach can also somewhat trickle down to engineering design. But you also see that type of work, not as just uh, solving a problem and then we have the one best solution. There's also a very, uh, well, a modest, humble interaction with the materials in the context for which you are uh, designing. Thank you. The next question, I think kind of follows on this um, by Eric Baumer. Um, can you talk more about accountability and responsibility given the incredibly limited capacity of the human designer in activities of designing with? How might we go about reasoning about the assignment of responsibility for the distributed effects of design? So specifically, um, I think you actually captured it really well, Eric, there, I think about the Need for accountability, responsibility within the limited um, uh, agency, I suppose. And in some sense, at the end of the book, I, I talk about this as like, well, how do we? What's the ask I have of of, of designers, um, given this kind of reconfiguring of, of, of design? But there's a term, specific term I use in relation to biographies and constituency, and as a role of the human designer as the speaking subject. And again, this is partly influenced by uh, Latour's notion of spokesperson. 
um, and 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 the scientist as a spokesperson for the, all the things, the, the phenomena, the non-human phenomena it, it is studying. And there's a really complicated notion of spokespersons you, or speaking subjects. You don't really know who they're speaking on behalf of themselves or the things. And there's but there's something rich in that ambiguity. But nevertheless, I think it is that role of you know. So I mentioned I think it's the it, it's the it, it's a, the human designer in the sense of the speaking subject that speaks on behalf of the biography, speaks on behalf of the of the gathering, the constituency, but also is responsible for gathering. That we talked about what values, what affinities, and how do we pay attention to who we gather um, that might be important with a given design thing that we something we want to design. So you know, and one of the things I talk about. Also, and this borrows um, from new materialism and Hannah Arendt's ideas of origin, um, that, that, that we are often, you know, I, I use the example of the kite. Um, we may, we being the human designer, the speaking subject might be at the origins of flying the kite. Hey, let's fly a kite, you know, grab a kite and go to the beach. But once at the origins of it, you then you lose control. But that doesn't mean you, you are not accountable for what happens in some sense, along with everything else. So I think you just have, to, again, that's the other part of the book is how do you navigate these questions of how we cohabit the world better and, our, and, and, and within the, 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 our world as being humans, how we are accountable for that as best we can. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, it also resonates a lot with uh, uh, Aristotle and his idea of <laughs> causes. <laughs> it's, this is old stuff, of course. <laughs> Maybe also with how Heidegger explains Aristotle, and so the whole idea of what 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 a cause is. And so um, I, I think yeah. we have really, uh, uh, well, we have that idea that you have to be the cause of something to be also held accountable for something. But for Aristotle, causation means taking part in a bigger process. Right. And so there are four causes. One of them is the causa efficient, so the the human causing something, but it's always also form and matter and material. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's a, a whole process in which you play a role. And of course, for that role, you can be held responsible, but you don't have full control over everything. So I, also there, I think that that whole humanistic idea of the autonomous subject in control of everything, yeah, as, as if you were the god recreating the world, we we have to leave that behind. But that doesn't make us unaccountable. Yes. I would yeah. say that again as an idea of the blackmail of humanism. So it doesn't mean that you're against human responsibility if you dare to doubt a little bit the the the, the, the superpowers of the of the human. Perfect. Ron, um, yeah. yeah, I'm going to sort of put two questions together here. First of all, from our uh, colleague Alyssa Antel, Simon Fraser University. Ron, you you touched on how writing this book and the ideas you developed will. Uh, or have changed your design and research practice. Can you talk more about this, but also following from uh, the last question, is there a potential, whoop, that just moved around, where did it go? <laughs> is there a potential for disruptive design? Um, can, you, can you talk more about some of the potential for provocative disruptive design that might extend from some of the ideas that you're presenting? Yeah, so I mean, I think I've talked about some of the things in which, you know, I think the book is asking me to change what, you know, I'm asking myself to change what I do and, and, and to work through the implications of that. I talked about some of the social design, the constituency, also really focusing on, you know, at the end of the day, it's about getting get more participation in a more than human sense. But I think this is specific to what in the humanist, the human centered design context, we would call design methodologies, and I call them repertoires. So I think we do need to, and part of the transmogrification was how we change physically as a designer. Methods are really embodied in, in, in many ways when we design. So, so I think there's a whole set of work on repertoires or, or, or design methods, and that, that's where I'd like it to go. The disruption question, I think, is really, I mean, I think the disruption question comes in relation to a, 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 a better acknowledgement of the politics of things. Um, and, you know, and I think we can look at, as I talked about biography, I talked about biographies and anti-biographies in the book that Peter, Peter Paul talked about that. But if we talk about, you know, we, we also talked about the public benches that, that, that exclude the unhoused from public spaces. And we could talk about that as a disruption. So disruptions are not inherently good. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I think that we, we, we need to, it's a battleground in some sense of interpretations. And, and, those, and those invite politics, or those are, are necessarily attached to politics. 
So I think in that shaping um, of, of that and, and the consequences, the, the, the inevitable consequences of the politics of things, uh, disruption will always have a role. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I can't answer the question because I was not the author of the book. <laughs> I am not the author of the book. <laughs> But I can tell you maybe what I learned from, uh, from reading this book from my own research practice. I mean, it's, it's really something that I, I think that Ron also referred to as the idea of design as experimental philosophy. I mean, I've, 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 I've really come to the conclusion that this is what I can learn from Ron, what I've learned from Sabrina House, who also runs former PhD student, uh, who I also helped to supervise. I think the, the whole idea that... I mean, within philosophy of technology, we had this empirical turn, as people called it. So rather than applying theory to technology, you first try to study technologies and then see how it challenges your theory. I think designing technology is yet another step. Um, interacting with the world, with materials, with your intentions, being a human trying to design something. And then all of that is at stake when you are designing. And as soon as you're in the process of designing, then you challenge all the concepts with which we can understand the human being and technology and the world around us. And I think that's really uh, the disruptive effect, I think, that uh, Ron's work and the, the work of the group of Ron had uh, on my thinking. That's also how you can really have this up and down between design thinking and philosophy. And we can learn a lot from this book. You know, and, and you, 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 you call what I do experimental philosophy, and I, I, I've now come to call what you do experimental design. Uh, <laughs> so, and I, and I think, and I think, but, but I think what brings with it is, is all the questions and, and, and the notions of ethics in the world. Um, and, and I think that's so connected. So I really do see what you do as experimental design. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Use a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <Doug. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll follow Kate's lead and also uh, combine two questions. Um, so the first one is by Stephen Mensbein, Eindhoven of the University of Technology. Ron, what do you hope that designers will do after they have read the book? How actionable is it for design practitioners, design educators, students, and others? And the second question by Brienne, this may be a bit more practical than philosophical, and it seems like the third section of the book explores this quite a bit. But what actionable practices do you think are most effective for us to genuinely consider and account for the unintended consequences of what we put in the world? Is it even possible for an individual to control this when working within a capitalist system? What actually seems to work in practice? Yeah, so all great questions. Um, and, and I think that, um, so, so as actually Stefan knows, because he's at, at TUE, um, I'm teaching a course now on um, design for debate, and and I was unsure, but encouraged to use the book as the um, topic, as as the point of discussion for the for the course. And this is a bachelor's level course, and everyone has read it, and it's been amazing. Um, I think the degree to which which students have taken on and reinterpreted terms like biography, constituency, question their practice, what they need to learn, and what they want to do, and how this has given them some language of what they want out of design. Um, has been amazing. So I do, th I, I, I mean, that was heartening to me. So I, I can see it, you know, that this really can be, as, as, as Peter Paul was saying earlier, a role has, you know, influence on, in design education. So Brianne's question, I think, and I tried to address this in chapter eight, and I think that, so address in two ways. So to those who don't fully buy this project and, they're, and are, are in, not that they don't, but they, maybe they can't, you know, like on some level you go, oh, this is a really nice place to visit, but given my day-to-day -day job, I can't move there. Um, but I think there are some asks of designers within, you know, professional design um, or, you know, common practice of design. I think there's a there's awareness. I mean, aware biography. I hope creates an awareness that you are connected to the things you design, and and that might shift. I think a lot of it is just shifting attention, shifting awareness of what your role is in relationship to the things you design. Um, I think that that biographical awareness will also give you some sense of the ongoing effects of the things that you design. And maybe there are some simple things like, and this comes with the ethics of AI. I mean, we don't think about the end of the something we design. Why don't we design a system that only lasts for a year? And then we just check it out and see what happened. What are the consequences? Do we, you know, why don't we time limit? What we think through the end, we, we tend to think so future oriented, this endless future that we just think of the beginnings and we throw things in there. I also think that maybe this has some relations to um, thinking ecologically. Hopefully this adds to some humility, which says, I don't have to design a whole new platform. I have to think more about niche designing, adding to parts, working with others, designing with. So, and I think you can do that very much in the professional context. There are some obviously more, more, more ex, uh, uh, 
committed notions I'd like to see, but I think that in you can do this either way in the, in the context of your design consultancy or technology company, it's a collective structure for designing. And so your, your organizational responsibilities are not separate from the ideas and ambitions you have about design. And I think we can critique our organization, our collective structures, and they've gotten us into a lot of trouble, but we can extend to, to whole new collective structures, social enterprises, um, collectives, you know, there I I've talked about one in the book, the Life Patch Collective, um, different ways of organizing as a collective group for what how we want to shape the world that we cohabit. I, I think that's that's not a dream. I mean, I think that that's very practical and something that can be put into place today, and is happening. I mean, that's not like there's not it's something. It's definitely happening. There are, there are examples out there. Yeah, so that's my that's, that's my response. Yeah. I'm not sure if I could add a lot. To that, I think it's really important what you say. I mean, if, if I would need to give one actionable advice to my students after having read your book, I think it's accounting for the width in design width. And so um, I'm not sure it was very actionable, but I think at least in a reflexive way, it is actionable. Always accounting for that width, for that relationality in which you are engaged and uh, including the, the non-humans in that width. I think that's uh, the most important step. Thank you. Um, so two questions again. Uh, the first uh, question from Troy and Gal. So if design is cultural, what does it mean that so many designers travel and discover? And then I uh, may be on the flip side from the chat a little bit earlier from Gary Oker up in Treaty 8 territory. Um, how do you see indigenous design thinking fit into your philosophy, particularly in the context of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People? Um, how do those two dynamics kind of fit together in your in your work? Yeah, so those are those are great questions, uh, both of them. And, and in the book, when I talk about nomadic practices, and you know, this takes in part from this idea of um, you know Deleuze and Guattari, but this idea of territorializing and deterritorializing and moving through and intersecting. Um, and and I think that that has that that as Peter Peter Paul was talking about earlier about intercultural, but I think that 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 shifting across exchanges across not just cultural and social structures or ways of being, but, but, but I think this also then leads to the second question of epistemologies. I, I, so if there is, you know, you write a book and there's always something you wish you had said more about, and if there's something I wish I had actually acknowledged more or gotten into more was this notion of, of indigenous, that the relationship between the more than humans we talked about even at the beginning of this um, and, and, and indigenous epistemology, indigenous ways of knowing, the UN uh, you know, charter is, 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 a, is a, a necessary, like so many other things that are happening now in relation to reconciliation is the real politics around having to enable and, and empower. And that comes back to the collective structuring. Um, but I also feel that myself, I need to do this with I, I, you know, I, I, I can only speak on behalf of, of uh, there's a limit to that. And, and so I want to engage this work more, but in, in you know, in, in, in part as an ally, in part as someone to learn who can learn. And, 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 and I am working on some projects now that really engage this more fully. Um, and I would think that there's a wonderful multiplicity of, in, if we had to say this, the notions of indigenous design, I think that, and, and I think that is something that we, 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 we can engage in. But I think the full acknowledgement, political and otherwise, of other ways of being in this world and other ways of knowing is essential uh, to, to, you know, it just, it, it's, it's, it's reflexive, but it's existential. I mean, it's a collaborative survival. Um, and those people, and, and, and many in this world that are not as privileged as I am, have had to deal with survival for a very long time and through generations, particularly indigenous in North America. Um, have been have been dealing with the very thing that the rest of the world is kind of waking up waking up to, the kind of existential crisis of cultures and societies. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I mean, if I would give some kind of a philosophical exploration of the implications of Ron's work, I would say that maybe the the notion of post-humanist design works here in two two directions. So post-humanist meaning. Um, beyond the human monopoly so it's uh, i mean culture is also material culture uh, and the material culture also affects us as human beings and taking responsibility for material culture also means taking responsibility for the culture that shapes us as 
as human beings, right? So that's also a decentering of the autonomy of the of the subject. But it's also post-humanism in the sense of moving beyond the humanist tradition, the very Western uh, way of seeing the human being as an autonomous individual subject. Yes, and I think that whole notion of autonomy, uh, the, the human being as a source of the reality uh, of everything around us, that's of course something that you have to give up in an intercultural dialogue. And uh, I think that's really uh, what you can learn from designing, <laughs> that, that you, you are not the source. So that, 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 that whole idea of, uh, well, the autonomous humanistic subject is really uh, excavated by doing design, uh, if you understand it along the lines of, uh, of Ron's work. Thank you. Next question is from um, Jesse Benjamin, who says hi, and thank you for the lovely conversation. Um, a slightly speculative question. I wonder what you think should or will haunt more than human design if we agree that any design practice will eventually be haunted by something too little or overly considered, reflected, embedded, etc. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's your specter, Ron? <laughs> yeah, well, I love the term haunt. I'm trying to think, how do I deal with that? And I wish I kind of had, had used that. Uh, um, what do I, I mean, let me say this. I mean, I think that there's not, I think, so, I mean, I, I, and, and this actually echoes partly, echoes what, what Peter Paul just said. I think that there's something about post-humanism which actually uh, in, in, engages us more in terms of what it is to be human. I mean, the post-human subject, what is that? And I think it's actually something that, 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 that is uh, one that is frail, one that can be haunted, one that, that, it, that is not this kind of you know, autonomous, discrete, all-powerful uh, uh, entity. You know? and, and I think that that kind of vulnerability is something that we, we, we can work with and that we will get it wrong in that sense, in the most plain sense. So, so I think that that's, you know, that, that, that that's important, but I but I also um, I wanted to make also point at the end of the book that there's nothing inherently virtuous about posthumanism, <laughs> so it's, let's not make that mistake. Um, and and but I do think that let's let's then kind of assess where it takes us. Um, and and I think it, and and the book was really that is this a viable is this a, 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 a to me it turned out to be a really rich way to critically and creatively speculate. And I and I come away convinced enough to to foster actions on my part, but but I think if anything you can learn from the book, it's not the right way, and it's not going to get us out of all the messes that we're in. But I think it gives us a clearer picture, and I think it gives us better tools. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, this is actually almost exactly what I wanted to say. Also, maybe in a very Heideggerian way again. Sorry, I'm in a Heideggerian mood, apparently. You're a philosopher. This is okay. <laughs> no, I mean, so the, 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 the idea that we would now see it all and that yeah, we exactly. redesign design <laughs> and that we would rehumanize humanism or something, that, that would be the biggest mistake. Yeah? So and I think this is what Heidegger said about technology. That it's, that it's kind of a trap. Yeah? So you, you cannot... Uh, exert power over the will to power and over to overcome <laughs> the will to power. Uh, so like this, so I think the, the danger is to see the message of Ron's book as a design assignment. So now, now we're going to design a new way of seeing design. It's also a lesson in humility. Uh, it's indeed designing with meaning that you should also well, change uh, your role as a designer and changing sounds too activist also, <laughs> maybe being open for more relations with the context in which you are designing to, to, to re-experience your role as a, as a designer. We're getting spiritual here. Uh, no, no, yeah, but, but, but I also <laughs> think it's, you know, it resonates. I think, you know, we, we, we wholeheartedly take on notions of change and innovation and progress. And these are the, what is what we need better, more specific, words for so i totally agree with that i mean i think you know encounter versus change what are we willing to be open is willing to encounter so that's you know one example ron a, a question from uh tekla Shaforst at the school of interactive arts and technology ron you stated i am not designing right now and yet as i am witnessing and listening with this conversation <laughs> i'm experiencing yourself and peter paul creating a space for conversations questioning and creating a quiet room for perturbations that are indeed a part of the connective tissue of design, the backdrop that enables insight to spark and perhaps take hold in each of us or some of us together. 
Beautiful. Your so, response. <laughs> well put, Tekla. And one of the things I would argue is what I don't want to do is get it. So I think you made a claim that we are designing. And I think that's great. And I think it opens things up. Beautifully put. And um, but what I what I really want to avoid, and maybe this is just too much having been involved in the world of design, is discussions about what is design. And 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 I think that this is I think it design it's performative. And I think you just showed us that. And you can make a claim for that performance. So I think that's great. Beautiful. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, Ron. This is a, was a beautiful statement. And uh, yeah, thanks. Take that. Um, I think that we have room for one more question before we conclude, and then we'll, we'll move to our uh, acknowledgements and sort of closing. Um, Dunya, would you like to read the last question? Yes, for sure. Um, so by Irfan Ravai, thank you for the interesting discussion. Apart from political narratives, how much role do you think behavioral economics and how people buy and hoard things influence our impact on the climate? Can we rethink design to address these issues? Nice one to end with. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess, I, I mean, first of all, I would say that there's a whole kind of political, political economy discussion to, to the book, which... I'm not. Able, I don't have the capacity to do, uh, but I acknowledge that in the book that I think there is there is there is a there is a, a large degree of work if one takes these implications seriously, and I would love to collaborate with anybody who wants to do that. Um, but, but the second thing I'll say is also I think we do, going back to the collective structures and nomadic practices is we need collective alternatives to the way to the to the not. I mean, you know, it comes down it's too often comes down to unfortunately ethics and design comes down to the individual designer. And, and, and that is just such a failing of our understanding and that just in, in the, the world that we've inherited. And also we've educated designers to think that they are the ones that are powerful and individually accountable, and, but yet the accountability has to be collective. So we need an alternative collective structure other than the current capitalist mode of production. And that's saying a lot, but it's true. <laughs> uh, and we do have them. And it's not saying we don't have them. We have other forms of exchange. We have other forms of collectives. We have other forms of economics. Um, and I think design needs to take that, and it has taken it seriously, but I think it needs to take it more seriously and engage that. So I think it is all as a matter of alternative, but I think even then to speak to those who are within it, I think to, to design within limits, to design with humility, to understand the end of the something that you're designing to, I think you can insert the notion of biography within the idea of designing products. I, I really do. I think, and I'm not the only one in doing that. I think a lot of other people talk in similar language around that. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, I could not agree more, of course. Uh, maybe from a European perspective, it also looks a bit different than from a North American perspective. I don't know. But I think the whole notion of design with also implies a, a deep form of relationality that seems to be missing in a radical capitalistic society where it's all about the individual. And I think uh, your whole analysis goes against that idea. And, and also, I mean, the most influential people in behavioral economics at the moment, of course, are Taylor and Sunstein uh, with a very interesting approach of nudging. But also yes. that really builds on the autonomy of the individual. It's, it's a very interesting position. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, right. So, uh, I mean, uh, they won the Nobel Prize with it. So who would <laughs> I be to, to, to go against it? But um, I think it still builds on that idea that libertarian paternalism is the answer. Uh, so we can be a bit paternalistic as long as there is an opt-out because the individualism uh, of the autonomous humanistic subject needs to be saved. And I think your book takes us way beyond that into an, an, a new form of relational thinking where we also have relations not only with other human beings, but also with the planet, with, with, with nature. And that ultimately could also lead to a new conceptualization of the societal cultural context for which and in which we are uh, designing. I see more future in that, uh, to be honest. Great answer. That was just a wonderful place to uh, bring this conversation to a conclusion. Um, and I want to thank all of the people who have tuned in throughout the day from all parts of the world. Thank you so much, uh, Peter Paul, for your comments and for being here with us. Thank you, Dunya, for moderating. Uh, thank you to the SFU events team for supporting us and to the School of Interactive Arts and Technology for supporting uh, this presentation today. Ron, I just want to give you the last word if there is anything you'd like to share before we conclude. 
Well, first, I want to thank you, Kate, uh, and I think it really wouldn't have happened without you. So, and I, I uh, and so I think if there's any, if the origins of the designing of this event, they 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 rest, <laughs> they, they rest with you. And judging by Takla's response, it's been a great, um, well done. And I just want to thank Peter, Peter Paul for for joining us. I, every, I, we could keep going. I, I I I love talking with you and and engaging these ideas. And and so, so that's really wonderful. I just want to thank everybody who came. I mean, that's that's humbling right there uh, for those people who joined us in this conversation. And I hope this is uh, obviously just keeps going um, and, and open to any other further discussions if anybody wants to just message me or email me. It's uh, really great. Thank you, Ron. Certainly, there are a lot of amazing questions still in the uh, Q&A here. So we'll be sure to save those. And I hope that uh, you can connect with those, those uh, question writers. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we wish you well. And um, Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.